morning, everyone. Welcome to the second Warren lecture uh, in this spring series. Our speaker today is Professor John Olson. Uh, Manuel gave me insider information that uh, John is from Minnesota, <laughs> and he actually was fighting to come in January. So it is his favorite time. Emmanuel said he couldn't get anybody else to come in January. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> so um, uh, even uh, that Professor Olson is uh, from Minnesota, he moved uh, to get his education in Notre Dame, where he got a bachelor and master degree in um, civil engineering and earth sciences. And uh, then he proceed with his, proceeded with his PhD at Stanford with Professor Pollock. Mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, getting his PhD, uh, he spent some time in uh, industry working at Mobile Research and Development Corporation in Dallas and eventually moved to University at, uh, of Texas in Austin where he's now a chair of the Department uh, of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. Uh, uh, Professor Olson's interest, as you can see, is in geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing. Um, uh, he, uh, he, he's interested in hydraulic fracturing propagation and fracture pattern development, and he's distinguished member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. With that, please join me in welcoming the speaker. Thank you very much. Um, one question, do I have a, is this a laser? Do I have a laser? Or I'll just point. I guess I'll point, okay. Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation. I'm always happy to come back to Minnesota, which um, even in the winter. Um, I grew up in Marshall, which some of you may have heard of Marshall out in southwestern Minnesota. So, um, but anyway, so I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about some issues related to hydraulic fracturing. The, the main technical content is going to be on some small scale experiments. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the business, too. Um, some of you may be very familiar with the oil business. Some of you may be less so. So I thought I would cover some, you know, why this is an interesting problem. So, um, so let me go on here. So I'll talk a little bit about the context of, of the technical work, which is essentially energy or the energy business. Talk a little bit about hydraulic fracturing. And then um, the main technical content is related to SCB semicircular bend testing that we've done on Marcellus Shale. Great, thank you. Just the laser though, right? I don't have an advancer. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some, some physical experiments we did on Marcellus Shale. Well, I say we, so this is mostly a PhD student of mine that just recently graduated. And then also some PFC 3D results. So hopefully I won't get in any trouble. I know there's some Itasca people here. so. Um, but um, we, I think we got some interesting results with, with PFC and hopefully we can continue doing that and then, and then wrap it up um, at the end. So, so one of the things here is interesting to look at. Um, you know, I'm in the oil and gas business. I'm in a petroleum engineering department. Um, so it's interesting to look and see where energy comes from. So this is a plot of the United States energy consumption. Um, 2015, the U.S. consumed about 98 quads or quadrillion BTUs of energy, which is about 98 exajoules. Okay, and this is going back to 1776. This plot. Okay, and so I, I, I eliminated a little bit off of here, but this is this is quads of energy usage per year for a bunch of different sources of energy. So back in 1867, this particular source peaked. Does anybody have any idea what what source of energy that would be? Primary energy. Horses. Horses. Well, we weren't, we weren't burning horses for, <laughs> this is actually a fuel. What kind of fuel? Wood. Wood. Okay. So that's the age of wood peaked back here. How about this guy right here? Coal. coal. Okay. And you can see that's persisted. And then next after coal? Oil. Natural gas. And then down here we've got, actually this one right here, nuclear. And then renewables are down below. So if so if you look at this, currently 35% of our energy, total energy usage comes from petroleum, which is basically liquid, um, natural gas, um, coal, nuclear, and then hydroelectric and wood are still high. They're, they're the highest two renewables that we use, which is surprising we use wood. Um, and then other renewables are up here on this very quick trend. That's mostly wind and solar. And so, 
Um, if you look at the trends here, you can see um, that coal is significantly on a downtrend here and natural gas mostly being replaced by natural gas. Um, so one of the contexts of what I'm talking about is the shale revolution, which is basically oil and gas produced from shale. And so I want to just show you what, how that's had an impact on U.S. production. And this also gives me an opportunity to brag about Texas, so I have to do that too, since I'm now, now a Texan, no longer a Minnesotan. Um, if you look at, again, this on the y-axis here is crude oil production in barrels of oil per day. So this is a million, two million, three million barrels a day back from 1981. And you can see basically the back in the 90s, everybody thought we'd reach peak oil. It's only, we're only going down, okay? And um, the United States is one of the most mature provinces for oil and gas production. Texas is one of the most mature regions within the United States. And you can see in about 2000, I think this is 2009 or so, everything turned around. And Texas actually tripled its oil production in a matter of about seven, well, what, in about maybe five years or so. And now this is the recent drop due to the drop in price, okay, so the economics and, and, and the results of stopping drilling. But this is really a spectacular resurgence and um, spectacular success of the industry to actually go through and triple its production. And pretty much all that stuff is a result of hydraulic fracturing in horizontal wells, okay? And if you look at other places where a lot of oil is produced, so here's a picture for Alaska. Alaska kind of peaked in the late 80s, early 90s. It's been declining ever since, and they really haven't taken part in any of the shale revolution. Um, this guy coming out of nowhere here is your neighbor to the west, North Dakota. Okay, um, so North Dakota was, you know, maybe 100,000 barrels a day, and now it's well, it peaked at like 1.3, 1.2 million barrels per day, basically because of the Bakken. Okay, and so really, it's an incredible resurgence in U.S. oil production. Okay, similar things happened in natural gas. Um, this is just a, a plot of the states. Um, uh, this is from last or from November 15. Some of this data is. Um, Basically, the reporting is a little bit slow, but this is, this is an old slide. But you see Texas is producing something on the order of, this is in millions of cubic feet, so 25,000 million. So this is 24 trillion cubic feet of gas per day. Okay? The second state is Pennsylvania. That's because of the Marcellus Shale, which I'll talk a little bit about, and those are the samples I'm going to talk about. Then Alaska comes in, Oklahoma, and so on down the list. And it's interesting here, we talked about millions of barrels per day for oil production. Um, one barrel, oil today, oil, barrel of oil per day is equivalent to about six MCF per day of natural gas. So that's the conversion factor as far as equivalent energy. Okay? And I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. So anyway, this, this 24 trillion cubic feet of gas is approximately equal to energy-wise 4.1 million barrels of oil per day. So Texas is actually producing more energy in natural gas than it is in oil, okay? Because the, the oil number was about 3.5 million. And what formations are important? Well, this is a plot, again, of, of gas production per day, Go back, going back to 2000 for the Marcellus, the Eagleford. These are all the main... Um, formations or reservoirs that are, are participating in the shale gas revolution. So you can see the Barnett, which is in North Texas, was really the first place where this shale gas technology worked. Okay? And I'll show you, it's, it's really surprising how far back the Barnett history goes. I'll show you a well, well result in a minute. But you can see it, it actually ramped up here and then it's been pretty flat. Um, this is all happening when the price was, was pretty good. The price has been pretty terrible since then. Um, but they pretty much maintained production. Then the Haynesville came in, which is in northern Louisiana, a little bit in Texas. And what's incredible is even with the current price situation, the Marcellus Shale, which is this guy right here, has been climbing um, ever since, okay, or, or climbing continuously all through um, the fluctuations in price. So it's really by far the most prolific gas reservoir in the shale um, collection of reservoirs. And probably more, more prolific than any other reservoir, even conventional, I think. But, but this is producing about something on the order of 16 billion cubic feet per day just from the Marcellus. But that's probably, I don't actually know what the number is, but tens of thousands of wells. The Barnett has about 25,000 wells. Okay? So this is, 
this, as far as the petroleum engineers go, this is good news because it's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to produce this much gas. You need a lot of engineers. Question? Just a second because presentation is recorded. Okay. <coughs> need to be on the video here, I guess. Yes. <laughs> so uh, does production, um, I suppose in different formations, does the percentage like produced actually used versus the percentage that has to get like flared off vary? Like does the, say, Bakken have the same sort of production capacity as the Marcellus shale? Um, let's see, where's the Bakken on here? So, so the Bakken is predominantly an oil producer, okay? And so the gas is associated with the oil, usually dissolved in the oil. When it comes to the surface, it, 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 it's separated out. And so you would never flare a gas well except for maybe just when you completed it before the pipeline. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't be producing a gas field if you didn't have a pipeline. Oil fields are often produced without a gas pipeline, and they just throw the gas, I mean, they throw the gas away by flaring it. Now that, a lot of political and um, environmental pressure has suppressed or, or, you know, reduced that. So there was a real problem in the Bakken that they were flaring a lot of the gas. Why did they flare it? Because they can't get a good price for it because there's no pipeline. But they can get a good price for the oil. You can always transport oil. It's easy to transport. And so, um, so flaring is, is really an oil well sort of thing. And um, I don't know, does that, did I answer your question there? Yeah, I was, I'm from North Dakota, so I was kind of curious about Yeah, that. yeah. So, so, but you wouldn't be flaring a gas well <laughs> unless, you know, unless you were doing something during the drilling process or something. But, but OK. Okay, so, so one last thing before I um, go to hydraulic fracture, the technical part of hydraulic fracturing here. It's interesting to look at individual wells to see how this, this technology of horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing, what kind of impact it has at the well by well. You saw on the, the national and statewide impact is, has been incredible as far as increasing production. And so if we look here, this is um, basically I went on the Railroad Commission's website, which you know in Texas the Railroad Commission doesn't regulate the railroad, it regulates oil and gas, okay? And it's been that way for almost 100 years. They're talking about changing the name, which I think would be horrible, because it's, it's just so anachronistic and perfect <laughs> that the Railroad Commission is in, in charge of oil and gas. But, but back in the 30s and 40s, actually, the Railroad Commission was more powerful than OPEC is today. They're the ones that set producing requirements and pretty much set the price of oil for the world, because the US was the dominant producer. Um, but anyway, this data is public data that I downloaded for, for um, six gas wells in the Barnett Shale, which is around Fort Worth in North Texas, okay? And this is a cumulative production, so this is basically looking at all the gas come out of the well. This is in, if you're not used to these units, again, I kind of buzz by this, but since this is oil field units, M means thousand, you use a Roman M, okay? So this is thousands of cubic feet, and this is how you pay for gas too, by the way. So it's about, I don't know what the price is today, maybe somewhere around $2 per MCF. Um, so this is a, a, a million thousand, so this is a billion cubic feet, two billion, three billion, four billion cubic feet. And this is time and months since the well was drilled and put on production, okay? And so what you see here is a wide range in performance of wells. So if we just look at this, this well right here was drilled in 1996. This is 20 years ago in the Barnett Shale. So there's a well that's still producing it was drilled 20 years ago. This was a vertical well, so basically just drilled straight down to the Barnett. The Barnett's about on the order of where, where you are in the basin, 5,000 to 6,000 feet below the surface. And there's a single hydraulic fracture pumped in this, in this well, so one hydraulic fracture. And this particular well took, to get to, let's look at, to get to 2 billion cubic feet, took about 190 months, which I think is somewhere around, I can't divide by 12 very easy there, but some 16 years or so. Fast forward to 2011, a horizontal well, so go down 5,000 and then the horizontal well is about a mile, the horizontal leg is about a mile long, so another five or 6,000 feet, 15 fracks, 2 billion cubic feet in about seven months, okay? A vertical well, well, the, a horizontal well to drill costs about 20%, 30% more than a vertical well, okay? So for the same cost for the well, now these frac jobs, 15 fracs cost about 10 times one frac um, with the technology. But, but for only a, a slightly in, slight increase in cost of the well, we've got, you know, 100 times better production, okay? So that's why the economics works, okay? This is an incredible uplift 
And basically, the big part of the economics, you have to recover your initial investment. That how fast do you pay the well off? Okay. Um, in, in today's prices, this well would probably never pay off, be, just because um, the, the, the initial cost and the, and the price. But back in 1996, um, that, was, that was not it. Now, what if we didn't have hydraulic fracturing? We'd be down here. So, so not using hydraulic fracturing means not producing oil and gas, basically. Okay? Um, so it's not a, well, there's an alternative. We could do it. It'd just come a little bit slower. You would never pay for your initial investment. Um, and, and it wouldn't be a, a significant contribution to the, uh, to the energy mix of the, of the U.S. So, so there's two things here then off of this plot that are interesting. One is that you know, the economics are incredible with the horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing. The other is you drill these wells and they're around for decades. Okay? This well is still producing 20 years later. So it's not like you drill it, you produce it for a couple years, and then you walk away. It's going to be generating income, but it's also your responsibility to maintain that well for decades. Okay? So you need to have, um, basically, I would argue, good regulations and, and economic structures in place to make sure that these wells are taken care of. OK, let's look, at, um, let's look at those same wells, but let's look at the rate. So this is how much gas per day. And this is kind of interesting to look at this again. So I've got that really good well is the green line here. This is a log scale, but um, this is in thousands of cubic feet per day. So this is a million to 10 million cubic feet per day. Um, that, that good well started out somewhere around 10 million cubic feet per day, which is a pretty significant rate. After two years, it's still producing 5,000 MCF or 5 million cubic feet. Sorry about the units. That not so good well, that old technology well, is still producing 100 MCF per day, okay, after tw almost 20 years. So now the question is, okay, these numbers, I mean, I work with these numbers a lot. They still don't really mean anything to me. So how can you, how can you judge what's the perspective here? So, so one way to do this is convert this into the units we use for electricity generation. Okay? So 5,000 MCF per day is roughly equivalent to 24 megawatts. Okay? And oftentimes people will say that will, that will provide electricity to so many households. I don't know what that number is. I'm in the energy business, so I want to compare this to other sources of energy. So that's where I'm headed, is to compare this to other sources of energy. So 24 megawatts is a good well in the Barnett. Marcellus wells could be 10 times better than this. This not so good well, 20 years later, this is an old well. Some people might say this well is a liability more than a resource, half a megawatt. Okay? Now this is actually taking the natural gas to the power plant, 40% efficiency, and this is how much electricity you'd actually get. Okay? The actual energy content of the natural gas itself is higher, right? but we waste about over half of that in waste heat when we run it through the power plant. So how can we compare this? What, what are some of the com competitors for oil and gas? Well, basically renewables, right? So are these competitive with renewables that we look at? Look at? So let's take wind power for an example. <coughs> um, not that I'm trying to justify my existence here or anything, but, but um, let's take wind power as an example. So a commercial wind turbine is typically on the order of 3 megawatts capacity. That means if the wind was blowing at the optimal speed 24 hours a day, that would be a three megawatt resource. Okay? Typical utilization, which means when is the wind blowing versus not, is about 25%. I think they've upped it to 30% now if you look at the US wind power um, website. But I use 25% here. So, so that windmill, which we think is pretty hot technology, and we're building these all over the place. Actually, even down my hometown in Marshall, there's, there's this ridge called Buffalo Ridge, which is, I think, 10 feet higher than the ground around it. That's, a, that's what's called a ridge in Minnesota. Um, they have a lot, of power, a lot of, I don't think they have these really big ones down there, but they have a bunch of windmills down there. But, but this, is, this is considered to be, you know, really modern, desirable technology. So that's roughly equivalent to 0.7 megawatts, that's roughly equivalent to a 20-year-old gas well. A 20-year-old gas well, okay? That new gas well is, is worth, you know, maybe, what, what was my number? you know, 20 or 30 of these windmills when it first comes online. And a Marcellus well maybe is worth 100 of these windmills as far as energy resource, okay? And so one of the reasons why I put this up here is just to show the, the two things. One is um, to replace the power or energy that we get from oil and gas is a pretty significant 
effort, okay, and it's a pretty significant task, okay. Um, the other thing is a lot of these old wells people want to get rid of because they have maintenance problems and things like that. I mean, they have a envir potential environmental impact. Um, if we do things right, sustainability, best practices, we can do a good job. But, but there are tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of these wells that are late in life, and they still provide a significant amount of, of, of um, energy to the country. So they're, what I would argue is they're a valuable resource that we ought to figure out how to utilize. Okay? So anyway, so that's just a comparison of, of where these things sit. Okay, so... Back to the technical content. I hope, hope I thought I thought it'd be worth it to talk a little bit about the business, just because um, being in civil engineering, maybe some. I know some of you work in the business, but you might find it interesting to see where this stuff goes. So let's talk about this: the technology that is responsible for this success, horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing. And um, just to get you oriented here, we're up here at the surface. We're drilling a well. The old technology, which this is basically. Well, old technology, I shouldn't say it that way. But this is a standard hydraulic fracture treatment. This is what I did when I worked at Mobile in the 90s. But this technology of drilling vertical wells and fracking them really started in the 50s, something like that. The heyday, I would say, of massive hydraulic fracturing, if you look in the literature, is in the late 60s, early 70s, when they were pumping these giant frack jobs. They might pump for 10, 12 hours in East Texas, um, fracking these sands. Um, today, basically what we're doing is we're drilling horizontal wells and fracking multiple times along that horizontal well, whereas if you wanted to put multiple fractures using vertical wells, you'd have to drill multiple wells in order to place these fractures <coughs> like this. So the power of horizontal drilling is we can drill one hole and put, I mean, in, in the Bakken, they're pumping 100 fracks in some state, in some wells, okay? So, so the, the economics of that is a significant advantage. We also get better ultimate recovery because we can put things closer together, put the fracks closer together. So this is really the technology that we're using. And this would be a, a view of this from um, a field development scale. So rather than having a pad where you clear the land for every single vertical well, you can drill well, as, as many as 15 horizontal wells from one location. Okay? <laughs> This is basically using offshore technology onshore. We call it pad drilling. And you can drill multiple wells to develop a huge area under the, under the surface. Okay? And so we drill our well. We have our vertical leg. Then we drill our horizontal leg. We start at the toe of the well, and we basically frack back to the heel. Okay? And we could be fracking. Typically, they do it in stages. So they might have three perforation clusters to as many as 10 perforation clusters thinking that you maybe are propagating simultaneously three to 10 fracks. That's, that's one of the technical interesting issues. But you might do this anywhere from 10 to 50 times in a horizontal well. Okay? And for all of these wells, you would do this. So, so it's really an industrial process in the subsurface operated from the well bore. But with, compared to what we did 20 years ago with minimal surface impact using these multiple wells in a single pad. Okay? And so then the process here basically bring a bunch of fluid to the, to the site, bring a bunch of sand to the site. We mix it up in a blender to make, you know, either with viscous <laughs> fluid or, or almost water. We send that to the pump trucks, which is where Halliburton will have all their uh, high horsepower pump trucks. Each pump truck is roughly like a diesel locomotive engine as far as horsepower. I think it's 2,000 horsepower to 3,000 horsepower. Pressurize it, send it to the wellhead, down the well, through the perforations, and propagate the hydraulic fracture. Okay, now this is a vertical well case, but you can imagine this with horizontal wells as well. Okay? And this is what it looks like on the surface actually doing it. Okay? And so here, all these tanks are essentially like a, a, a semi truck trailer size. I think there are 500 barrels, I think, each one of these of, of fluid. Water tank. So this is, this is 100 truck trips. To the site, so that's one of the big impacts of, of this kind of process. Um, these are the blenders, and then there are about 20 pump trucks at this particular site. So 20 pump trucks, we're talking, you know, 50,000 horsepower at this site, and they might pump as much as 200 barrels a minute down the wellhead. And you know, if if you're a royalty owner, you're sitting in your on your porch watching the dollars come in. If you don't have any interest, you're over here getting pretty mad. 
because this is noisy and, and, and a, a, a nuisance. Um, I'm not going to go into all the other potential environmental stuff, but I would argue we can do this right. We know how to do this right. Um, but it, it, even if we do it right, it has a significant impact on the communities where you do it. Okay. So that's a little bit about the process. Um, so I've got, I've still got some time left here. So, um, so one of the really interesting things about the shale world is when we pump these hydraulic fractures, the rock that we pump in is very heterogeneous and it has a lot of natural fractures in it. And um, one of the things that people think is why the shales work so well because shale is never, has never been considered a reservoir rock in the past because it just doesn't have the permeability that you need. And nobody thought that we could, you know, basically enhance our well bore enough to produce out of it. But with hydraulic fractures and horizontal wells, we can get enough surface area in the reservoirs that even though that the flow capacity of a shale is maybe, or, well, is orders of magnitude less than a sandstone, for instance, we can still get economic rates. How do we do that? We have to put a lot of surface area into the subsurface. One of the ways we get that extra surface area is the fact that these hydraulic fractures interact with natural features that are already in the subsurface. Okay? And so that's a big technical problem that people have looked at. So here's an example of a frack job in the Barnett. This is the well. This is one of the vertical well cases. Okay? This is a map views from a paper in 2004. All these little gray dots are the micro seismic events that were recorded during the frack job. So little faults that slipped and gave off energy because of the hydraulic fracture going through the subsurface and changing the stress state. Okay? So the idea is if there was a micro seismic event, the hydraulic fracture must have been at least near that spot. Okay? And so in order to get, it's not, so a hydraulic fracture I would have said 20 years ago was a single fracture. It was about an eighth of an inch wide and maybe a few thousand feet long, a few hundred feet tall. This is almost a kilometer wide of activity. That doesn't sound like an eighth of an inch hydraulic fracture. Okay? Um, it's still a kilometer long. So the idea is that this hydraulic fracture goes out, hits a natural fracture, changes its direction, propagates along that natural fracture. So we propagate the fracture out in some sort of grid that has a huge amount of surface area. <coughs> this technology of micro seismic really didn't come into being until about 15 years, 15, 20 years ago. And so we didn't have this view of the subsurface in the past. Okay? Although, um, although there were some ideas about things might be more complex than our simple models describe. Okay? So, so what, what are we imagining happening here? So this is, again, a map view. We have a bunch of natural fractures that are already in the subsurface. We're pumping a frack job from north to south. The frack, which is driven by fluid, hits the natural fracture. The natural fracture diverts the fluid along or it diverts the fluid along its path and then kinks off. Now we have, instead of one fracture propagating the well bore, we have two, and then that happens over and over and over again, and we get this incredible complexity of hydraulic fracture geometry. Okay? And so really in the early 2000s, this was revolutionary thought. This was a totally different picture of what's going on in the subsurface. Really, a, if you want to call it a paradigm shift in, in hydraulic fracture understanding. The interesting thing about this is this particular diagram is from a paper from 1987 when people were pumping frack jobs in what we call tight gas sandstone in Colorado. And so where Pinsky and Teufel were working on this project and they had the idea that yes, you know, things are more complicated in the subsurface than we think. Okay? And so this, this was not very widely accepted in the 80s. Now we think everything happens like that in the 2000s. Okay? But really, it took 20 years for this idea really to be widely accepted. And also, it took micro seismic, so we had a lot more data to support it. Okay? But it's a very interesting approach. And so why is this important? Well, I'm not going to go into details of modeling today, but, but that will dictate that idea, that idea of how fractures propagate will dictate how we build our models and the physics that we include in our models. So these are just a couple examples of hydraulic fracture models. This is very simple idea just you put a grid out there and don't really worry about the details. Here you can model individual fractures propagating, running in. These are natural fractures in the subsurface and look at how the fluid interacts. Okay? But we need to know more about the physics. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about mostly experimentally what the physics is for this interaction of hydraulic fractures with natural fractures. So we basically looked at 
um, fracture mechanics testing of cores, cores from the Marcellus Shale from Pennsylvania. Also, we did some synthetic rocks. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we built some synthetic rocks out of hydrostone with embedded natural fractures. Um, and so this is the experiment, experimental setup we had. So we're doing semicircular bend tests, which is essentially this is a picture of it. The sample is usually typically maybe a half inch in depth, an inch to a few inches across, and, and basically in this semicircular um, geometry. So here's an example. This is actually, I think, an inch and a half across. This is one of the samples in our apparatus. And the thing that we did that was different that we thought was interesting was we found samples that had natural fractures in them, and we were looking at how this propagating crack interacted with those natural fractures, okay? And so that's what I'm going to be mostly talking about. So these Marcellus samples we got were recovered with what you would call a vein, okay? So these are cement-filled natural fractures. And in this particular case, these are all calcite-filled natural fractures. And so we took those samples. Normally, you, you drill a plug into these kinds of rocks to make your semicircular bending sample, because that's the convenience of it. You can take half a cylinder. Well, if you try and plug these things, everything falls apart. So we basically had to saw these into hexagons. And then sometimes we would grind them to make them smooth, because we were worried about the geometry. And ultimately, we said, well, that's silly. We can just test the samples like this. But we were able to, when we tried to plug these, we had about 10% success rate of getting good samples. When we did the sawing, we had 90% success rate. And so we're trying to recover samples that have veins in them to do the test on those samples. And as you know, here's how the semicircular bend test works. You have these rollers, so you're basically loading from the top, but this, as the sample bends, these will roll out, and so you basically have a bending, um, a bending loading, but with some crack parallel compression, and we're driving the crack out of that notch. As you can see, it would propagate up like that. This is a sample without natural fracture in it. So what, how did this work? So here's an example of some of our test results where we propagated these cracks. And we're basically looking at how the notch-driven crack interacts with the natural fracture. Okay, And um, one of the things we're able to do with these Marcellus samples is since these samples are so small, we could do repeated tests on the exact same vein. And what we did was we arranged the, the for instance, that's that vein. And we could arrange different angles of approach by cutting our sample slightly differently. And we we're trying to look at, see, basically, how could we understand this propagation process. We also had a series of tests whoops, where we um, looked at different thicknesses of vein. You can see this goes from a, a millimeter or so out to about seven or eight millimeters um, to look and see whether the thickness of the veins were important as well. And this is all in a paper by, this is, um, Hunju Lee is my PhD student who did this work. Why, why that horizontal cracking is happening? Because it seems oh, like that's these are not. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, in in the figure uh, one from bottom, mm -hmm. uh, the third row from top, why you are getting the horizontal fracture? Because things are under compression. The well, way that I see it. Well, okay. Let me let me just describe something first. So these are just just to reference you. These are vertical cores from Marcellus. So the natural fractures are all vertical fractures. Okay? Um, and so basically we, we rotate the sample. So bedding is in this plane right here. Just to give you a, I, I don't think this is your question, but just want to reference you. These are all vertical natural fractures. So a, hydro, a vertical hydraulic fracture would intersect these at some, you know, substantial angle. Why is this cracking like this? I'm going to come to that in a minute. OK, I think that's what your question is. Why is this fracture fracturing along there like that? So okay, thank you. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But I just want to remind you that I'm not saying that the Marcellus is full of bedding parallel veins, although there are some bedding parallel veins. We're looking at bedding perpendicular veins predominantly from this sample. OK, so let's just look at the uh, one observation to start with here. This is one of the samples. We have a fracture propagating out of the notch. And you can see it gets attracted by this vein. So it's, a, it's got a different Young's modulus, probably. It's a, it's a, heterog it's a mechanical heterogeneity that impacts propagation. Um, and so we're looking at how, you know, whether it crosses or not. But one of the things we found in this particular case, and I think if I blow this up, you can see it a little bit better. Um, if you've ever looked at cores from the subsurface a lot, a lot of times the veins will basically fall off and break open along this interface between shale and calcite. And one of the really surprising things about this set of tests 
was that was not the weak interface. These, all of these Marcellus cases we did all fractured within the calcite, which actually was really surprising to us. Because now, now part of this is we self-selected. We couldn't, we couldn't test a sample that had a weak interface that fell apart in handling. So we did have a biased set of um, samples, perhaps. But still, that we, we tested a lot of samples. And this is was, this was a very surprising result. And one of the questions about if you're going to model this interaction, you want to know what defines a strength. Is it the bonding of calcite to shale that defines a strength? Or is it the strength of the calcite? And you would use different numbers for your strengths if you, if you didn't know the answer to that, that question. OK, so let me back up for a second then. So we made some observations to try and explain this. This is just kind of the fundamental result of, of what happened in the cracks. And so then we took, looked at the veins, the calcite in the veins, under a petrographic microscope. This is with plain polarized light. This is with cross nickels. If you look over here, you can see that there's all these little, what we call fluid inclusion trails okay, on, these, um, on these veins. And those, you could imagine, are planes of preexisting weakness. Where do they come from geologically? Well, basically, if you imagine you have an intact rock, it cracks and it fills with calcite, cracks again within the calcite, fills again, cracks again. We call that the crack seal fracturing of a, of a, of a vein. Um, and so all these bubble trails, every time it cracks, there's a little bit of gas in the fluid that goes in and, and provides the, the fluid that precipitates, the calcite saturated fluid that precipitates to seal the crack. And they don't completely crystallize. And so you have all these fluid inclusion trails that basically um, leave weaknesses in the rock. And so we think in these cases, that's probably what's driving some of that internal failure of calcite. When you look under cross nickels, you can see actually the crystals of calcite that are in, um, in uh, crystallographic continuity here, but they're actually growing in fits and starts. Okay, But all the crystals of calcite actually span the entire width of the vein. So we're not breaking along crystal boundaries. We're breaking along these, presumably, these fluid inclusion trails, which are how these fractures and veins form geologically over millions of years. OK, so, so it seems that failure occurs internal to calcite. What about angle of approach? When do we cross versus divert? So when we, we did these tests at orthogonal approach, we typically, for the thin veins, we could cross. So this propagating tensile Tensile crack, okay. A hydraulic fracture is a tensile failure at the tip, but it's fluid driven. These are absolute tension, okay. So we'll come back to that issue in a minute. But we saw crossing to diversion and kinking back, and then complete diversion as its approach angle got further and further away from orthogonality, okay. That wasn't a new result. People that looked at frictional interfaces saw that when you go orthogonal, you're more likely to cross. When you go oblique with your tensile crack, you're more likely to divert. Okay. But, but it was interesting to look at, instead of frictional interfaces, which don't have any cohesion, to look at, you know, these are bonded interfaces. And they were still modifying this crack. Now, now again, this is not an all-around compression subsurface stress state. And, and I'll address that at the very end again. But, but, you know, we did see some interesting results. And so this transition from crossing to diversion, we thought, well, maybe we can say something about the strength of the vein by looking at that that transition. And um, so we went to uh, fracture mechanics, looked at the um, um, energy re release rate criterion, okay, which is, which is um, um, propagation direction dependent. So this is dependent on two um, um, stress intensity factor terms, which from Neusmeyer um, is defined by this. And, and Theta is the angle of propagation from the tip. Okay, I don't have since I've used all my time talking about Texas. I, I don't have time to explain the equations that much anymore. But but this is the the criterion we used. Okay, and if we look at this diagram over here, um, what I've done is plot the 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 value of g versus the propagation angle. So straight ahead propagation is zero degrees. Thirty degrees would be kicking off thirty degrees. To the right is positive. To the left is negative. 90 degrees would be um, orthogonal propagation off the tip. And you can see that in a homogeneous space, the maximum energy release rate is to propagate straight ahead. Okay, And so you can see, if you looked at this case, propagating straight ahead has the highest energy release rate. So that would be the favored propagation direction. Orthogonal would be down there. That would not be favored because it has a lower energy release rate. 
and obviously turning propagating backwards along where you came from um, would be even a lower energy release rate, right? But what if you didn't have a homogeneous body? And so now if you look at the hydraulic fracture coming out to hit a natural fracture that has some finite strength, you can look at the case of what's the strength of the matrix in terms of energy release rate versus what's the strength of the natural fracture, okay? Now, our experimental program is to try and quantify what this strength is, but let, I just want to show you that this is a useful thing to know. So we look at propagation straight ahead. Here's our value of G for a given loading for different propagation directions, okay? So again, the highest energy release rate is at zero degrees, but let's say that we're at a loading that is slightly below the strength of the shale. Is there another path we could take? Well, if we look at the angle which would be propagating along the natural fracture, if it has a lower strength, we'll actually exceed its critical energy release rate before we'd exceed the shale's critically, critical energy release rate, and so our fracture could divert. Okay? And so what we're trying to do with our experiments is try and find out when this happens, and hopefully then we can figure out how much lower is the strength of the vein versus the shale. And why don't we just directly test the calcite? Well, that's really an impossible <coughs> test to do, we would argue. And it also, you'd have to dismantle your sample in order to directly test the calcite. Okay, so if you look at this plot here, then you can say um, in our test, and this is again from 0 to 180 degrees for that propagation angle, this is the curve of G. Um, if the rock strength were um, or excuse me, if the vein strength were equal to the rock strength, we'd be up there at one. Here's where the vein strength is 75%, 50%, 25%. What we found in our experiments is that at 80 degrees, we got diversion. And at um, 90 degrees, we got crossing. And so somewhere between here and there is when we, we, we um, hit the actual strength of the vein. So we said, well, we can guesstimate based on using this fracture mechanics criterion, which is not accounting for a heterogeneous sample. We're using the homogeneous equations, but, but we got in the ballpark. So we, we use this to estimate our vein energy release rate, critical energy release rate is somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the shale. Okay? And so we thought that was a new result to be able to take that experimental result and actually quantify the strength of those veins. So we think that's probably one of the significant results of this, this work done by this student. Okay. The other thing that was interesting to look at was, so that's looking at approach angle. Um, what we're really looking for is a way to quantify strength. And so then we think if we're quantifying strength of the vein, it doesn't make any difference whether we're under in situ conditions or not. Okay. Strength may modify when you take the sample to the subsurface, but at least we're getting one surface measurement of strength. The other thing that we looked at was, it doesn't make any difference how thick the vein is. And so this is coming back to your question. I'll show you the results. I don't know that I have an explanation, but I'll show you the results. So for orthogonal approach, 0.01 inch thick vein we cross, 0.035, it actually gets diverted into some cleavage planes here, but it's sort of crossing. And then over here, it completely fractures along the entire vein, and here it does as well in the thicker veins. Now one of the things you thought, well, maybe it's just bending so that, so that vein is actually just failing, not because this crack is hitting it, but because I'm bending the sample and this is a really stiff vein and it just cracks. But if we look at, I mean, these, these, these crack like this, but we did some high, high speed photography and we couldn't, we couldn't get quite high enough speed because it is a fast crack, but we pretty much convinced ourselves that nothing fails until this crack hits the vein. And then we did some analysis and we figured that the bending is really not that significant compared to a crack, an opening crack in an infinite body. I don't have that plot here, but, but it's the same amount of bending that a hydraulic fracture would induce ahead of it because of its deformation field around the tip on order of magnitude. Okay? So why does this happen? Well, one of the explanations is, well, it's just like, just like strength of materials idea. The bigger the sample is, the weaker it is because it could have more flaws. Okay? So one of our ideas was, well, these big veins have a lot more internal flaws, and so maybe as this crack tries to move through, and it's a fairly significant distance to move through that vein, maybe it's more likely to get diverted, okay? Um, energetically, 
our analysis can't allow, at least at this point, can't, our, our analytical analysis can't allow for the thickness of the vein, so we don't have a good answer for that. I will show you, though, I think I have time to do this still. I will show you our PFC simulations, and they reproduce this, okay? And so, um, so if you have a good idea of the mechanism for this, I'd, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. But it is interesting geologically, though, what do I do if I need to characterize my reservoir? I need to know the orientation of the natural fractures, relative hydraulic fracture direction, to determine whether I'm going to cross or not. And I also need to know something about the thickness. Okay? So that gives me clues of what are, what are the things I need to quantify in the subsurface in order to aid in the hydraulic fracturing planning. Have you inspected the, the surface of the fracture to see if it's a tensile fracture or a shear fracture? Do you see um, a lot of powder, That inspection for would be difficult on the physical samples. I'll show you in the PFC. Um, all the failures, PFC can tell me whether there's shear or a tensile failure. All the failures are tensile. Well, of course, it depends how you calibrate the PFC. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me go ahead then. Um, I'm going to skip this for right now. We can come back to it. But basically, we, we came to the, the conclusion that the critical energy release rate, which we're calling the strength of the veins, was about a quarter of the shale. And so the weaker the vein, the more likely it is to divert the hydraulic fracture. The stronger the vein, the more likely it is to cross. So we repeated these tests with PFC 3D, okay? And we used something on the order of 20,000 particles, okay? Um, we, our, our, our limitations was we wanted to make sure our vein was at least five or six particles across in the orthogonal direction, okay? And then we calibrated the properties, um, and I'm going I'm to go through this pretty quickly here because I'm running out of time, but we calibrated the properties based on triaxial tests, unconfined compressive strength, and then SCB tests for toughness. Um, so when we matched the Young's modulus, this is in GPA, the Marcellus shale is about 9 GPA Young's modulus. Um, we could get a pretty good match for it. Then we, then we went to UCS to, to calibrate the bonds. And when we got the bonds calibrated, um, our tensile criterion was toughness. In order to keep using this UCS bond strength, um, our tensile strength was about twice what we were shooting for, so we couldn't get it closer than that. But, but a factor of two, I, I would argue, is pretty good. Um, and then Poisson's ratio, we, we varied the shear versus normal stiffness and got about a 0.3 Poisson's ratio as our input. So we calibrated those parameters in PFC. And then this would be one of the tests. This is load in newtons versus displacement in millimeters for the ram coming down. And you can see up here I've got, I've hit peak load, and you can see I'm starting to get some crack propagation off the tip and also a little bit of failure in the vein. Okay, but I didn't have failure in the vein prior to that propagation. And then the continued propagation of the crack is as the load falls. Whoops. And so we thought we got fairly representative results in PFC compared to our numerical, or I mean our physical samples. And green is tensile failure and purple is shear failure. And so again, it, it, you know, it depends. To use these spherical particles is not really what the, what the veins are, but I sort of think it's just a numerical tool. So you have elements that have bonds between the elements. And so I think, I think this is... It's not exactly the same, but it's fairly representative, I think. And so, you know, most of the failures we are seeing were tensile. So, um, so that's basically what we think is probably the, the result that we saw. And all the, we didn't see any shear surfaces on our physical samples, but that's a really hard observation to make. I don't know that we could be confident that there's no shear failure based on our observations. So this is one way to try and assess that. Okay, so... Um, just real quickly then, one of the problems we have with PFC, because we actually didn't get a single crack, right? We got a little zone of cracks of failure. And so how do we determine whether we actually crossed or not? Because there's actually a thickness here. So we looked at the diversion length versus the actual width of our propagating crack. And when um, that ratio of x over w got larger, I can't remember what, what the student, larger than, well, I can't remember what it was, like larger than 1.5 or or something like that, then he called it diverting versus crossing. But I'll show you the results of that for some tests we ran. So we basically, one of the powers of the numerical model is we could vary the approach angle every five degrees. We couldn't do that with our physical samples. We didn't have enough rock. And so we ran all these tests, 
This is for a case where the Young's modulus is the same between the vein and the shale. Toughness of the shale is half the toughness of the vein, and that gives me a, a G sub C because the energy release rate is toughness over modulus. So the higher the modulus, literally the weaker the material because it has higher stress in it for a similar displacement load. And so we plotted up the data then for different approach angles versus different x over w. So the higher x over w gets the more diversion we have. Does that make sense? Okay. So x is it hits the vein and then it diverts by x. Okay. W is the width of the vein coming in. And we saw basically we got diversion somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees approach angle. So it crossed at 90 degrees and it wasn't crossing at 70 and below. Okay. And so then we basically wanted to take that and compare back to our strength <coughs> measurements. And we did this for a wide range of, of results, or a wide range of, of I'm going to skip this slide here. We did it for a wide range of strengths of, as far as the toughness values. And we saw that the stronger the rock is, you know, the more crossing we had, the weaker the rock is, the more diversion we had. Okay. And, um, and so we thought this was pretty representative to our physical samples. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead. This is going to be a last, my last slide as far as, as presenting here because I want to give you some time to ask some more questions. But we also wanted to look at this issue of thickness of the vein. So we went, this isn't a huge range, but we went from 1.9 to 3.2 millimeters. And in PFC, we saw a similar result to what we saw in the laboratory. Now, we still haven't figured all this out, but um, this was encouraging. So um, in the cases where we had thinner veins, we saw less diversion, although we had a pretty significant failure along the path here. Um, but once we got to the really thick vein, we only kinked off at the very end of the failure. So the thickness seemed to have a pretty significant impact on crossing versus not. And again, you're probably thinking, well, it's all about bending. And if I didn't even have that notch in there, I would get the same result. But I would argue we've done some work looking at a full space not with PFC, but analytically and looking at the displacements ahead of a hydraulic fracture, or excuse me, the displacements ahead of an opening crack. And the amount of bending you get in this sample, like I said, is similar to the amount of bending you would get just because as the fracture opens, the material right ahead of the tip gets pulled in and the material outside of the tip on the sides get pushed away. So you actually do bend the rock ahead of an approaching opening mode crack. And so if bending is a result, a real subsurface hydraulic fracture would have bending ahead of it in a vein like this, just like the SCB sample. So even if it's a bending result, it's still a physically pertinent result for hydraulic fracture. Okay. I'm sorry I don't have a better explanation of this, but this is this is a side view. You might be interested. We took some oblique views with see-through particles, basically, and you can see that um, the fracture plane is it's you know the the <coughs> failures are occurring all the way through the depth of the sample. Okay, this is just another view of our results. And here's, that goes with that, this goes with this. Okay, so vein thickness seems to be very important as well as the approach angle. And one of the things we haven't tested, which we're, we're, we're working on, is in the subsurface, the stress state is also very, the compressive stress state, okay. And so we can take, hopefully take these samples, put them in the subsurface, put them, the numerical samples, put all around compression on and look at how the anisotropy and the compressive stress impacts the results. One thing I'm worried about is the higher the anisotropy, um, the less important all these other details become. And that's kind of the result that's been found in the frictional interface experiments that have been done in the, in the lab. But, um, but I think still these, these results are pretty interesting. So let me, let me I think, yeah, so that was, that was my last slide. So, so I'm not going to uh, spend much time um, summarizing other than just say that I think, you know, we had some interesting physical results. We have a mode to do um, some numerical analysis. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot of interesting work to do beyond that. Thank you. We have time for questions. Let's thank the speaker. What's the basis for your assumptions regarding the pre-existing cracks? You know, you just show them as though they're randomly oriented in... Well, no, I, mean, I, I didn't show any cases, but for instance, in the, in the Barnett, yeah. Um, one of the, there's two dominant directions of veins, vertical veins, pre-existing veins. One is orthogonal to the current hydraulic fracturing direction, which would be parallel to SH-min. Mm -hmm. The other one's parallel to 
the hydraulic fracture direction. And so if you look at samples from the Barnett, for instance, which we mm -hmm. know the best, it's highly likely that a hydraulic fracture would be crossing a lot of veins. So based on geologic characterization of the subsurface. Is that, is that what you meant? When you say veins, these are what? Calcite? Cemented, cemented. Cal well, in, in the Barnett, they're quartz filled, but in the Marcellus, they're calcite filled natural uh -huh. fractures. And what is the role of the um, you know, lamina bedding. lamination and yeah, bedding? Well, I, I didn't show that in this particular case. If when we did our um, SCB testing to, to get the toughness of the shale, it made a big difference whether we were propagating across bedding planes or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would argue in a lot of these hydraulic fracture cases, you have, you have some initial height growth, which would be impacted by the bedding layers, but then eventually you get to your, you know, you have a penny-shaped crack out to the stress barriers, and then you have mostly lateral propagation after that. And so we're looking at that lateral propagation of the hydraulic fracture moving away from the wellbore, so it's interacting with these natural fractures. So that's, that's the direction of propagation that these experiments are really focusing on and not the height growth part. But height growth is an important part no, no. of the problem. Okay. All right, thank no you. No question. <clears throat> I've hard time understanding the tensile fracture when you have the very thick vein. Can you tell me about what is the direction of the, the, the tensile stress, the maximum ten, the, the, because is that like a front? Um, so, We've done some abacus modeling. Of, I, didn't, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't look at that before I came, but we have a, another um, case of that. We've done some abacus modeling of these same geometries. And um, as that notch crack approaches, I can't tell you the details. It, it's, there's, there's tension in both directions. Yes. I think the tension perpendicular to the vein for those fat veins is actually higher. So I think the orientation of the principal stress um, depends on the Young's modulus of the vein and the thickness of the vein. But I, to be honest, I didn't, yeah, I mean, I didn't study that enough to be able one, to answer one, you intelligently. One possibility would be like, like a tensile front moving like that. But that would mean that the, the maximum tensile stress would be horizontal, parallel to the vein. Yeah, and, it, and one of the things I do remember from the abacus results is, is I don't think there's a whole lot of gradient in stress because the, where you, typically those veins are higher modulus and we kind of have pretty much uniform stress throughout the vein. Now that, in a real case, it would have to die off, right? If you're in a real um, subsurface case, but, but yeah. Yeah, I, I just, when I put this together, I wasn't thinking about that, and I should have had more backup for that particular Last question. Question. But it's an interesting problem. Uh, John, uh, could you go back to the equation for your G? Sure. Maybe it's a silly question, but I think this is only valid when your fracture goes straight parallel to the existing. So propagation must be parallel to the existing fracture, if you have any not deviation. For, not for this equation. So we have K1 and K2, which depend on angle of propagation. So this is from Neusmer's paper. So this is his look at, you know, what is a G for a whole range of propagation directions. So I'm pretty sure this is a, so, so straight ahead, K2 is zero. Um, diverting K2 would be non-zero. And so that'll modify, that'll modify the result. So this is this is K2 bar, which this is a this is K1 and K2 are the actual stress intensity factor of the crack as it's loaded. And so in most of these cases, there's only a K1. But these parameters from Neusmer are, are these you know effective stress. I don't know what he calls these, but they're like effective stress intensity factors. There is the actual loading, this K2 and this K2 are zero the way we load the sample. But you still have a, a, a lowercase K2. I think I we, <coughs> okay, sorry. We have more questions, but we have to finish now. But there would be a G mechanics seminar in room 2005 on, <laughs> this, on the same topic. And I'm sure John would attend. Yeah, it. I'll be there. I'll be and there. You and you will here have, until yes. Until 5 o'clock today. Yeah, so. and at 4 30, we have reception, so you can ask questions out of the scope of the yeah. seminar. But now I yeah. would like to ask you to thank John for interesting <laughs> And again, Jew seminar to room 205. <laughs>